So uh, where I'd like to begin is telling a little bit about my story. And uh, you know, if you take a look at what I am today, that's definitely not where I started. I started off as just an engineer. And so for example, I did my undergraduate and my graduate studies all in electrical engineering. And I uh, did my electrical engineering graduate studies at MIT. And when I was finishing my thesis, my PhD advisor, Muriel Medard, gave me some really great advice. Uh, I was on my way to take a faculty position to be just a card-carrying electrical engineer at a school in the Midwest, University of Illinois. On my way there, and uh, I don't know if anyone here is from Illinois. All right, fighting Illini, all right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and she strongly encouraged me to call up my future boss, the department chair, and tell him to delay my start date. Tell him I want to delay my start date, and then I should go and do a postdoctoral study in something wildly different. And so she had never steered me wrong, so I listened carefully. And I was very fortunate to do a postdoctoral study with the gentleman you see here, uh, Emory Brown. And he's a very uh, interesting fellow because he's a physician, practices anesthesiology. He's also a neuroscience researcher at MIT. Uh, but it turns out he has a PhD in statistics. And that PhD in statistics was the key link because all the stuff I learned in my PhD was a lot of applied probability. So I had this language to begin to learn medicine through the lens of what I was trained in my PhD. And so I took that combination with me when I went to the University of Illinois, working at that intersection, and I also got involved in fooling around with technology development. And so that's sort of the story of what led me to where I am today. Had it not been for my advisor telling me, she didn't tell me to go study medicine, she just told me to do something wildly different. And had she not told me that, I wouldn't be along the path that I'm on now. And so um, I'd like to motivate the story for starters with a picture of this uh, uh, pregnant lady that you see right here. And she's in the hospital. She's pregnant with twins. It's a very high risk pregnancy. and. Um, uh, only, only in about 26 weeks, uh, she's having these massive uterine contractions. And if these, uh, um, as you can imagine, if these, if these two twins were born uh, early, this would be devastating. And so what typically happens is you have to go uh, uh, to the hospital. They might perhaps put you on bed rest. They put these clunky belts over your belly to measure things like your fetal heart rate and the uterine contractions. And uh, if, you take, if you take a look at this look on her face, she's not happy. And that's in no small part because of when she has to take a bathroom break, they have to take this off and reapply this. But perhaps even more so because when she leaves the hospital after her 10 days on bed rest, she has to go back home and she has this high risk pregnancy. And what happens if these babies are born really early and there's a problem? And so that inability to be able to, to monitor yourself when you go home, stories like this are what really got us interested in exploring. Um, can we uh, go beyond the status quo? Uh, these, these clunky belts that are only used in the hospital, could there be opportunities to build unobtrusive technologies to measure the same types of information so perhaps this could be used when someone is in the comfort of their own home, for example, during a high-risk pregnancy? So, uh, you know, I'm fast-forwarding here to 30,000 feet. After four years of hard work and collaboration in Illinois with material scientists, we were able to demonstrate in 2011 uh, uh, a system that looks like this. And so this is a flexible electronic system that has sensors that are embedded inside of uh, flexible materials that can adhere to the skin. As you can see very clearly, they can bend and stretch uh, uh, naturally with the, with the human skin. You can instrument these systems so that they not only have sensors, but they have uh, uh, components for things like uh, uh, amplification and wireless transmission. And so when we... Um, we demonstrate these devices. Uh, this was right around the time when I first uh, transitioned to coming here to UC San Diego, 2011. And I got very interested in exploring uh, the use of these technologies in a real clinical population. So we partnered with some obstetricians at UC San Diego to do a validation study. And one of the things that we did is we took a look at women in labor at the UC San Diego hospital. And we did a side-by-side -side comparison where we record things like the fetal heart rate and the uterine contractions with the conventional technology. And side by side, we take a look at the signals that we acquire uh, with our flexible sensors. And we can do things like do a side by side comparison of the fetal heart rate in blue, which is uh, uh, recorded with our flexible technology. And in red is what is acquired with uh, conventional uh, approaches. So as we started to get preliminary data that looked very exciting uh, in these controlled studies, uh, we started to have many, many uh, physicians at UC San Diego who wanted to work with us to explore the use of this for a lot of applications. And uh, as is the case in many situations, the bottleneck began to be scale. 
and our mindset began to change drastically. Uh, in our first, that first picture I showed you of that device uh, mounted onto the skin as it stretched, that was a fundamental new capability that never existed before. And that's very exciting. It appeared in you know, the journal Science and C CNN and New York Times. And you know, you're really sort of broadening people's horizons. But now we want to make the rubber meet the road as engineers. We're not as much interested in demonstrating a new capability as we are in building a system that is robust, that consistently works, that you could massively manufacture so you could really get this in the hands of a lot of people. So this is a different mindset, and myself and my graduate students got interested in asking, could we build the same type of devices that we demonstrated in 2011, but can we build them in new ways that are compatible with the way that, sil you know, that, that silicon chips or, or flexible LED displays are made? And it's a, it's a different mindset, and so my graduate students have invented approaches where we can actually uh, build these devices on top of the same silicon wafers that they make uh, computer chips, and you can literally just t take a piece of scotch tape to peel off the sensor, as you can see in the top left. And we can also make these systems so that we can take off the shelf components for amplifying the signals or encoding them for wireless Bluetooth transmission, taking parts by other companies and making them backwards compatible with our process. So we now have things that are scalable, cost effective, decoupled and modularized. So these are some of the new engineering approaches that we take is building the same systems, but in a way that can really scale, that can robustly work, that makes the yield higher, and makes the time to production smaller. And so uh, with that, uh, another aspect of what we got interested in from an engineering perspective is, now we can take these devices, we can embed them inside of adhesives that are typically used inside of a hospital. And in fact, our mindset came from getting insight from some of the nurses at the hospital that they work with. It turns out that whenever they do a blood draw from you in the hospital, after they do the blood draw, they apply this material made by a 3M called Tegaderm uh, right afterwards. Well, that's what we embed our sensors in. So we embed our sensors in the same thing that they use inside the hospital uh, right after they do a blood draw. And we can embed these, uh, these systems that can sense data, that can digitize data, encode it for wireless transmission, but there was another bottleneck that we started to think about, and this is where some of the eth ethics and whatnot comes in. Uh, as you start to talk to some of the people uh, about asking, how do you feel about these devices? We're, well, not everyone has had the same experience with the uh, healthcare establishment. Uh, some people, uh, when they interact uh, with the healthcare establishment, there's a lack of trust. There are questions about privacy. Increasingly, if we start to think about the fact that you know, if Hillary Clinton's server can be hacked, if a Fortune 500 company can be hacked, perhaps so can my doctor. So how do I feel about all of this data about me being transmitted to the cloud and being stored somewhere, and what if that data were, were to be hacked and, be, and to be used against me? So what we started to think about is, uh, well, what aspects of this information is really actionable for a clinician to make a decision in terms of an emergency? What types of statistics are typically done? And it turns out that increasingly sophisticated types of algorithms uh, that sort of uh, refine uncertainty and allow for decisions to be made can actually be done right on those miniaturized chips inside of those little adhesives. So we now are developing a workflow where we're actually developing some of the statistics and some of the algorithms that affect decision making so uh, uh, you can have that information and only when there's uncertainty to the point that we think a doctor needs to intervene, only then is that transmitted. So this is sort of a balance of uh, uh, clinical utility with, uh, with privacy. This is, these are the sorts of things that we think about uh, as engineers. And so our long-term vision is to replace that picture that we had before uh, with a picture that looks like this. Uh, these are their ongoing clinical studies that we have with the Department of Obstetrics at UC San Diego. And what we're very excited about in situations like this is that we can um, allow for uh, some of these situations with high-risk pregnancies uh, for someone to be able to be monitored in the comfort of their own home and in the event of something abnormal or uh, an emergency situation, a doctor indeed being, uh, being able to be, uh, to be called. And so uh, something else that has begun to occur in some of collaborations not only here in San Diego but also in the Bay Area with uh, UC San Francisco is when we first think about this picture, we think about this lady with the high-risk pregnancy, this data when necessary can be transmitted to the cloud so that a doctor can intervene. But what we uh, increasingly uh, began to think about is um, uh, if we wanted to foster a sense of uh, trust and a sense of community, 
what types of aspects can we take advantage of? And so, for example, lots of people build trust and relationships in their communities, uh, such as their church and whatnot. So can we create unique opportunities where we can encourage more women to go and get prenatal care by virtue uh, of health coaches built from the churches and communities that they engage with naturally? Um, not to mention, uh, from a, a pure dollars and cents perspective, uh, it turns out that the payers, the insurance companies are very interested in this because the idea is that uh, some of you may be aware that if a baby is born premature and ends up in the neonatal intensive care unit, they call them million dollar babies because that's how much, that's how much it costs to take care of babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. So if I'm an insurance company, I'd rather pay a dollar now for some preventative care with a health coach in the community to encourage this woman to follow up with her prenatal care as compared to this baby being born premature and having to pay you know, millions of dollars later. So there's this very interesting intersection of community, fostering trust, and actually incentivizing the insurance companies to want to push this forward. And I think uh, we're, we're gonna see more of this as, as these questions of cost and care uh, continue to arise, uh, uh, you know, as is taking place right now with Congress and everyone else. So I'd like to uh, fast forward for a minute and tell you about, uh, you know, what really gets us excited right now. You know, that, that's a story that I've been telling for a little bit. And so uh, here's a picture uh, of me and my dad at a, a family reunion in uh, uh, 2004. And uh, it turns out that I, I unfortunately lost my dad to pancreatic cancer in, uh, uh, in 2011. And uh, it turns out that my dad lost his mom to stomach cancer. And so, you know, uh, for, for some reason on my dad's side of the family, there is this issue of GI problems that seem to arise. And so as we established this technology, this flexible electronics technology, I got very curious to understand, you know, what is the story right here with GI? And are there, are there sort of interesting opportunities? So if we stand back and take a look at the status quo with GI more generally, you know, if you meet this gentleman, Bob, and he's having some GI problems, what is the status quo with what takes place? Well, you know, he goes to his primary care physician or his doctor, and he complains about things such as pain or bloating, vomiting or, or constipation. And a lot of you may be aware of this. And it turns out that uh, there are not really objective ways that they can assess what's going on with your GI problems. It's very much symptom management. Well, let's try this, this type of drug, this medication on you. You come back and tell us how you feel. Are things going away? Remarkably subjective at what occurs. And so if you take a look at the array of different types of GI problems that can arise, you start to see pictures that look like this, you know, dyspepsia, motion sickness, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, you know, it just goes on and on. Gastroparesis, uh, some of us in the audience might uh, have some of these conditions, and you see so many commercials of pharma companies trying to treat uh, all, all sorts of these conditions right now. Remarkably, pretty much a lot of these are called uh, disorders, right? And in some sense, what a disorder means is that they don't exactly know what's going on, so they just give it a high level label. And so what we got very interested in is, you know, can we try to innovate within the context of, uh, of, of uh, the digestive system? And as a side note, what I always like to remind people, uh, and people in China know this very well, do you guys know what they call the GI system in China? They call it the second brain. And the reason they call it that is because we, over, we have over 500 mil million neurons in our digestive system that coordinate the activities. You know, as, as you guys may know, our digestive system has to squeeze the food from the stomach to the small intestines. So there are all these neurons that are coordinating all of this. And in addition, it turns out that our digestive system is connected to our brain via our vagus nerve. And it's not surprising that stress creates stomach ulcers and vice versa. So we know that adverse effects on the brain affect the GI system. But increasingly, we're starting to realize that adverse effects on the GI system affect the brain. And to make that point clear, some of you may be aware of a recent uh, report that came out. It was on CNN and a variety of other places where they basically uh, increasingly now believe that Parkinson's disease, a brain disorder, may, uh, 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 may, may as well start in our gut. And if anyone's interested, I can tell you a whole lot more about that later. And so um, if we stand back to Bob, who is having these GI problems, how common is it for Bob to have these GI problems? Remarkably, 10% of people, when they present to their primary care physician, it's because they have a GI problem. One in 10 people, which is just a remarkable point. And so the, you know, the aggregate cost, direct and indirect cost of dealing with this, it's $142 billion annually. 
So we started to get increasingly interested in trying to address this problem, especially because in the event that you get referred to a gastroenterologist, everything they do is invasive. So you either go from being uh, uh, everything being subjective with your primary care physician to going to your GI doc. They do an endoscopy on you to determine if there's some, some sort of cancer or some sort of physical blockage. Or they send you over to nuclear medicine to do a gastric emptying test on you where they make you swallow something that's radioactive and image it as it goes through your stomach, vice versa. So um, the high level status quo is that you either your primary care physician, everything is subjective and system management, or we go to things being objective with a GI doc, but it's all invasive. And so our vision was, can, can we imagine a situation where we could build something that is uh, non-invasive, yet objective? And the idea, this could be sandwiched in between the primary care physician and the sophisticated invasive things that they do with the GI doc. We were not, for sure, not sure if we could pull this off, but we wanted to explore it. What I liked about this application is it fits very much my, uh, my training and the types of things that I've developed at the intersection of medicine, technology, and analytics. So we established a collaboration uh, with my graduate student, Armin Garabans, who I'm very proud of. He just won this big award. Uh, some of you may be aware of Tom Siebel, who's a billionaire, who, uh, uh, you know, Siebel Systems, et cetera, et cetera. So he creates a fellowship every year uh, for 80 graduating PhDs who had the most innovative PhD. And my graduate student, Armin, is a 2017 uh, Siebel Scholar for the work that I'm about to share with you. And so uh, we collaborate with an adult gastroenterologist, David Kunkel, as well as a pediatric gastroenterologist, Hyatt Musa, as well as a radiology and bioengineering professor, Elliot McVeigh. And so the high level idea that we got interested in, this is remarkable, imagine cardiology before the EKG. It was a very, very different place. Right now, if we think there's something wrong with your heart, the first thing we do is we do an EKG on you. Well, it turns out that your GI system has electrical signals as well. There are these, 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 these pacemaker uh, uh, cells inside of your GI system that coordinate uh, your motility and whatnot. They generate electrical signals, which is suggestive that we could be able to measure them. And so it turns out that uh, some researchers in New Zealand characterized what a normal stomach looks like by doing invasive surgeries, as well as what the abnormalities look like. And if anyone who's familiar with cardiology, this looks very, very similar. You heard of something called a conduction block, or et cetera, when they pace things and whatnot. This is pretty much the exact same picture with a variety of different sort of situations that can happen. The top left is the normal sort of pushing of the stomach downward, right? The top right is, is when the speed of that is somewhat abnormal. The bottom left, a conduction block, is when there's a certain location where it's not conducting for the smooth muscle cells to contract. And the, the, and the bottom right definitely would probably give rise to nausea or constipation because rather than pushing downward, the smooth muscle cells are pushing upward, pushing in the wrong direction. So these are the types of things that we see with people who have GI problems from invasive surgery studies. So you could ask yourself, well, since they generate an electrical rhythm, why not try to do something like an EKG for the gut? Well, it turns out there's something called an electrogastrogram that exists. You put three electrodes over the surface of the abdomen. It turns out the smooth muscle cells of your stomach squeeze at about three cycles per minute, which is 0 0.05 hertz, a very slow signal. So people have developed a workflow to put three electrodes over your abdomen. You get one waveform and you look at it in its frequency to see is there a lot of energy at three cycles per minute. Unfortunately, this is not used in research or clinically. The reason you guys have never had this when you had a GI problem is because this test does not correlate with symptoms or with anything they measure invasively. So what we got interested in doing is thinking for a second about cardiology. And one of the things we know about the heart is in the heart, they can do things where they apply many electrodes and they can use radar types of procedures to basically infer a lot of information spatially. So could we do the same thing with GI? And it turns out the answer is yes. So by using an array of electrodes mounted over the abdomen, we can actually now infer that wave of gastric uh, emptying. Uh, but the bottom line is that we can start to extract information about the direction that the smooth muscle cells are moving, as well as the speed. And this directly correlates with GI symptoms. 
And so uh, what this means is on the left, we had the traditional picture of a signal you've never heard of. You've probably heard of an EEG for neurology, an EKG for the heart. Turns out there is an EGG, but it's never used. And we're bringing it back to life. And what we're showing is that if you use a high resolution system with multiple electrodes over the surface of the abdomen, we can actually start to infer that wave of propagation as you can see in this little animation here. This is from real data. And uh, one thing I'm very proud of is that I've given talks like this to the past to other people. They've come and been some of our research sub subjects for these GI studies. And so we've actually done a lot of other cool things. So for example, uh, with our uh, radiology collaborator, we actually, uh, the stomach is moving so slowly that they can actually do multiple slices in an MRI, and they can actually uh, visually see the motility take place. And we did that while simultaneously uh, putting our electrodes over the surface of the abdomen, and we're validating, as you can see in this picture here, the actual propagation of what's taking place, and it's consistent with what we got from the MR. So we have lots of validation really showing that what we're picking up non-invasively has the same information as if you were in an MR magnet. And so what this means is that we have the ability to determine the stomach contraction, direction, and speed just with electrodes over the surface of the stomach, and we can also show how they change in disease. So this picture on the left represents a healthy control where most of the, uh, the gastric activity is moving in about this 180 degrees direction. For, su for a subject that was diagnosed with moderate gastroparesis, according to our procedure, you can see that it's mostly propagating in the opposite direction, indicating an abnormal initiation. And then a subject with very severe gastroparesis, the coordination of the smooth muscle cells is all over the place, and they're moving in all sorts of crazy directions. Not surprising why someone has nausea or, or, uh, or, or other sorts of issues. And so um, uh, with this, what we next uh, attempted to do was to go towards ambulatory monitoring. All of the studies that we did at this point were done uh, uh, in the hospital for about 90 minutes, have you uh, take a meal, and we watch what happens. This is about a $30,000 piece of equipment that we used originally, and we want to transform that into a $1,000 piece of equipment where you just wear a fanny pack with electrodes covered over, uh, over your abdomen. And so we did that, and we were able to now do 24-hour studies on multiple subjects, normal subjects as well as subjects with a GI disorder. And one of the things I'd like to point to you is uh, this, this third picture right here. What I'm plotting is frequency versus time, and the color represents where most of the energy is. And these two normal subjects, remember the money is around 0 0.05. What you see is that there's activity, it kind of goes away, there's activity, and it turns out that there's a circadian rhythm, like the, throughout the 24 hours of the day of your gut. But if you notice in this third patient right here, notice that it's always active. It's just always on. They're just always, almost like a, like a seizure of your, of your GI system. It's just persistent and it's on. And so it, and this is communicated more clearly in this picture on the right where you can see that there's more of the power centered uh, or further to the right in this third patient. Turns out this third patient had what's called a gastric pseudo obstruction. And what this means is that they don't have a physical blockage in their stomach. But it turns out at the bottom of your stomach, when the food is going from your stomach to your small intestines, it turns out that basically the coordination of all the cells is messed up. So each of the individual cells is trying really hard to pump, but they're not in synchrony. So they're trying really hard. That's why we see that big signal. But because they're not in synchrony, they're not pushing it out. Now what's fascinating about this is that this is a, a, a clinical uh, issue that is hard to diagnose, but easy to treat. It turns out for this issue, you can just do a Botox injection and it'll treat this problem. Uh, so our, our clinical collaborator, <laughs> yeah, Botox, right? Our <laughs> clinical collaborator was ex extremely excited because we have an ability now to separate this and disambiguate this. And I know what a lot of you guys were asking, uh, well, have you guys taken it the next step and can you do it with the tattoo? Yeah. And it turns out the answer is yes. And so we have some preliminary data where we've gone from the $30,000 system to the $1,000 system with the fanny pack and now pushing towards the next level, which is with the pure flexible electronics. Turns out this is a different physiologic signal, so we had to change some of our engineering approaches. It's such a slow moving signal that any engineers in the audience, you guys know that you might have a DC offset that occurs, so you have to be sensitive to the DC offset. We had to change the materials, but after doing that, it turns out we can use our flexible electronics now to measure these, uh, uh, these gastric signals. So in short, what this means is that we've really kind of gone full circle. We did not know for sure if we could get that green part uh, uh, of that arrow, but we now are increasingly confident that indeed that we can. We can actually go 
from the, the standard the starting point, which is go to your primary care physician, one in 10 of you, you claim you have some type of GI problem. Let's imagine now an EKG-like signal could be ordered to assess objectively what is taking place, and that could influence what the gastroenterologist does with their subsequent decision making. And as I mentioned, this is in part a personal story because of you know, my dad's side of the family, but we just realized, oh, by the way, one in 10 people have these problems. Now, uh, my last slide that I'm showing you is, how does this sort of fit into the bigger picture of the interaction? You know, to really make impact, you have to think about sort of many things. You know, the doctor, you know, you could imagine now that a doctor could say, well, I'm gonna do a 24 hour study on you in your own home, and then I'm gonna look at the data and we can see what happens. I think that's very promising. So with this data that we can collect, transmit to the cloud and go to the doctor, that's great. Uh, but I think there's a lot of other interesting things that can occur as well. And so, I mean, I get so annoyed sometimes when I watch, well, this is being recorded, I should be careful with what I say. But if you guys notice, there are so many uh, drugs on the market right now that are supposed to be treating this, this type of constipation, that type of constipation. One of the things that's remarkable to me is that if they were gonna build a drug, let's say, to treat a heart condition, right? What they're gonna do when they test the drug is they're gonna do thorough EKGs and whatnot to see specifically what aspect of the heart condition is it making it better. Yet for a lot of these uh, GI types of problems, everything is really symptom, symptom reported. Imagine if we could have an objective way through clinical trials to assess the efficacy of a variety of these drugs. I think this creates that opportunity and that's one of the directions that we want to go. And I think that this could influence uh, the payer landscape because insurance companies only want to pay for stuff if it's very effective. Uh, what I'm also uh, sort of very interested in is um, this could actually affect the regulatory aspects of which of these drugs uh, get approved and how and can we imagine if in the future uh, these things are marketed to us only after they have been uh, evaluated objectively to assess a specific aspect of your GI function that's occurring. Um, not to mention, as a lot of us are aware of, if they give you a drug, let's say for your heart or for your sleep, guess what the adverse effects are in many situations? On your GI system. So in the future, we can now imagine drugs that are treating other bodily problems and imagine they have multiple molecules, all of them that seem to do a good job of sleep, we can now objectively assess, well, which one of these has a minimal adverse effect on our GI system as measured objectively? These are the types of opportunities that we think the framework that we're developing sort of provides. And so um, uh, with that, I uh, conclude my talk. So, so thank you. So Todd, you had a couple of things that I noted when, when you were speaking, and in one of the last talks that I came to, um, Dean Alpisano, who is the Dean of the Jacobs School of Engineering, was here to speak about the amazing things that you all are doing in, in the School of Engineering. And you mentioned something that, um, that you bake in the clinical utility and think about privacy from, it sounded like a design standpoint. And you said, this is what we think about as engineers. So we've been, I've been interested in engineering and ethics and what kind of training you get. And I think that from my experience with you, you're much more sensitive to thinking about ethics and privacy. And so I'm wondering if this is something that is cultural or is it something that is just a high priority for you and how do you build ethics into how your trainees are thinking about building technologies? Well, I. Uh... I think there's, a, I think on CNN, this guy Anderson Cooper, he has this segment where he says keeping them honest, I believe, or keeping us honest or something like that. So one of the things I like to encourage in our research group is for us to be our own devil's advocates and to ask ourselves, you know, so or just to back up for a second, when you, when you get a bunch of experts in one area together, in some situations they can get caught in this echo chamber where they keep, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it kind of gives, you know, it's part of the issue that we have right now with the left and the right. And, you know, if you're only getting articles from your friends that share the same political view as you, you're literally in these two different alternate universes. And I think that engineers sometimes, if they're not careful, they can be in their own echo chamber where they're only listening to their own types of ideas and what they think are the challenges, but you're not really meeting, you know, how is this thing going to be used? Who are the users going to be? and start to really ask yourselves natural questions and engage the community. And so I would say what we do that's different is that we just try to keep ourselves honest. And so we 
try to be our own devil's advocates. That's why I'm so eager to engage you all because you all would be the potential users of this and you all are gonna give us insights that we're not going to think about. And what's very interesting is that the insights that you give sometimes are transformational and they just change how we think. It's not necessarily that it's a really big engineering challenge, it's just a very different challenge we hadn't thought about. And once we have that insight, we can factor that in. And so I think, um, I think it's the, the perspective of always keeping ourselves honest and I think not all, I think in, in any situation where you have a bunch of experts, it's much easier to kind of just circle you know, amongst yourselves uh, but you run the risk of being caught in that echo chamber, and I think I, I always just like to um, make sure that we're engaging a variety of different people, so we don't end up, uh, you know, uh, kicking ourselves in the foot. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I think part of what happens with this kind of the technologies is that you're capturing so much data. And you're capturing it in real time, and it's much more granular than anything that we've normally had. So one of the questions from the audience is, who owns or controls the data, and can it be turned off? Yes, I uh, just had a conversation with someone in the audience about this. You know, can it be turned off? That's a very uh, basic, simple uh, engineering design choice. I think the question becomes uh, a lot of these, uh, these businesses, when they create uh, their products, they try to make that very hard to do. They want to be collecting as much data as they can about you because they think they could potentially monetize that and sell that to an advertiser or to someone else. And so I think, um, uh, so, so first of all, can it be done from a design principle? It's easy to do. The question really becomes, Will the, uh, uh, will the companies do it? And the, the thing I always like to encourage people is that it's always the case that the power is with the consumer. And so I think the most important thing that can happen is for you all to be aware of, of the variety of different things that are taking place that perhaps you're not comfortable with and you can start to make uh, different choices with the products that you buy. And I would imagine that over time that can arise. For me as a researcher, I'm interested in building stuff testing it clinically, pushing it forward, but ultimately this has to be carried on by a, a business or whoever else, and they have to make those, uh, those decisions. Uh, but what I also think is very interesting that is beginning to get some, you know, some conversations are happening in different circles is from a pure legal perspective, if my body generated this data, shouldn't I own this data and shouldn't I control how it's used? I think those are very interesting legal questions that we need to keep thinking about. Um, uh, it's, I, I imagine this is only going to continue as time arises, but if I'm generating this data, shouldn't I have full control over how it's used? Uh, it's, it, these are natural questions that we should be, begin to ask ourselves and to call our, our congressional officials about, right? <laughs> so you talked about a million dollar baby versus an insurance company being incentivized to proactively do prevention and, and really support community-based health programs. So how are insurance companies starting to, or are they starting to move toward incentivizing prevention? And are the tools that you're making that have gone from you know $30,000 to 1,000 to now maybe affordable, right? How are those things intersecting to make the costs reasonable for the consumer and something that is incentivized by insurance companies. Right, so, so first of all, the question about the, uh, uh, the insurance companies, yes, these trends are taking place. Uh, they're in, in two different ways this is occurring. Uh, first of all, um, uh, so some of us are familiar with Kaiser Permanente. They're very, very passionate about innovative approaches to get people to, uh, um, to comply and actually change their behavior and or take their medication when they're supposed to. So they have a variety of uh, uh, different applications. Uh, uh, increasingly, um, employer-based in insurance companies, so big employers, in many situations now they'll, they'll do things Well, they will pay for you to, you know, to have a, a personal trainer, pay for you to have a Fitbit, will uh, you know, affect your, uh, your policy based upon how often you work out. So there are a variety. Of, there are a variety of approaches that many insurance companies are um, 
uh, are interested in. Um, something else that is increasingly happening that some of you guys may be, be aware of is, is this notion of, of capitation that's taking place in the healthcare system, where the burden of decision making is increasingly going to the provider. So, you know, the old approach was that an insurance company, or rather a doctor, would do a procedure and then they bill the insurance company. But increasing now, what insurance companies are saying is, I'm going to pull all these people together that have these common types of conditions. I'm going to give you a lump sum every year, and you have to figure out how to manage them. And so increasingly, in order for the uh, providers to be able to stay in the black, they have to be very creative in how to manage these patients. And these types of applications start to be very, very attractive just you know, in order to stay in the black. So there's the, the, you know, the, the old approach with insurance companies uh, trying to be innovative, but also these new models where more of the burden is being on the, on the provider. And they're very much incentivized because it's a question of being the red or being in the black. So this is one of the situations where I think where the, 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 the incentive, the profit incentive can be aligned with the well-being of the individuals. That doesn't always happen, but these are some things that have the potential for that to occur. So it, it also pushes up against an ethical issue. So if my employer is incentivizing me to wear a Fitbit and notices I sit on the couch a lot and I'm not moving much, could that be used against me? And, and are there protections in place? And this gets to the question, can I turn it off? But I guess you don't have to wear it. So anyway, I'm just. The, the, you know, I love these questions. I think these are the questions we should, we should all be having with ourselves, right? Because on the one hand, we want there to be individual responsibility. We want to encourage people to be engaged in different behaviors. But there are boundaries that need to be crossed with our privacy and our ability to make our own decisions. Not to mention there are so many other factors that can give rise to why people do or don't do what they do. Their economics, where they live, questions of food deserts. I mean, it's, it starts to get very, very complicated. Uh, I do think that overall, though, uh, trying to uh, balance some aspect of, um, of uh, uh, personal responsibility uh, uh, via incentives uh, with having common protections such as, uh, you know, no longer uh, the issue of uh, uh, pre-existing conditions and striking that balance. You know, that's, that's the beauty of politics, right? You have one extreme, you have the other. Both of them have good ideas, and hopefully we meet somewhere in the middle. And so I think hopefully that balance will continue to arise, but we need to be very, I think the most important thing we need to be doing is having conversations. So I think through conversations and through dialogue, people start to see what all the different unintended consequences are and we meet somewhere in the middle. Perfect. Um, one of the things that you asked here, or that one of the people in the audience asked, is if your work could potentially eliminate the need for a colonoscopy. Can you get to the point where your external sensors can indicate the health of internal organs, which it sounds like you're getting to? Uh, I love the question. <laughs> we, we've, we've had these questions ourselves. Uh, uh, I would say stay tuned. I won't go into more details than that. And if not, uh, if not totally eliminate, it could uh, uh, reduce how often it needs to be done and, and to pinpoint exactly uh, where we need to focus. So um, perhaps not totally eliminate, but to uh, 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 the, the insights that we can provide already with the preliminary evidence that we have suggest that we can be much more, um, much more precise of what and when uh, we need to measure as it relates to GI. Yeah. Talk to me more offline when the recorder is not on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the commercial sensors have really gotten crazy. I mean, they're everywhere. So there's all these kind of different kinds of wearables that you can buy at Best Buy or Apple or whatever. And I know you do a lot of work in underserved, hard to reach, underrepresented communities. Are you finding that these kind of commercial products are designed for everyone? Or are there potential barriers in how they're being designed? Well, I think at the moment, uh, I mean, for, I, don't, I don't own a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, for example, Why? so it's not even a, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm on, I'm on camera, I should be careful. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, at the moment, the, the types of information that it provides me, it hasn't reached the point yet where it's sufficiently uh, providing utility. I mean, I, I think for some people who are, um, perhaps who, who run all the time, you wanna watch how their heart rate changes as a function of this and that, I think that's nice. 
I think one of the issues that we're having right now, the reason that we're in this state of wearable fatigue is because the type of actionable information that we have is not exactly there yet. I mean, the, the, these wearables, there's only a, a limited set of things that they can measure and they're still somewhat inaccurate. And so I think um, there's two things that need to occur. I think first of all, we need to think concretely about um, why would someone want to wear this? What utility uh, would it provide them that would be worth it? And secondly, can we provide the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sensitivity to be great enough to deliver on that promise? And that's, that's, the, that, that's where I think the, uh, the opportunity lies. And if you guys notice in both of, both of the examples that I provided, I started off with a problem that was very clearly articulated. If this person could have, if this pregnant lady could have this at home, she could manage her pregnancy. Then from that, the problem dictates the engineering challenge and you move forth with the solution. Uh, similarly, within the context of GI, I started off with this problem of everything being symptom related, et cetera. If we could manage these aspects, et cetera, this could you know, bring forth much better care coordination within GI. That mindset is actually is not as common as we think within the field of engineering and technology development. People just want to build something and they pray and wish that it's going to solve all of our problems, just like Google Glass. I think Google Glass was a great example. Google bet very aggressively on that and it ended up being an epic fail. And so I, uh, I personally like to take the approach of let the problem dictate the solution. And if we do that, it's going to be a longer process and slower, but I think the value proposition to the end user will be higher. And in, in getting to your question about the underserved communities, you know, people who have um, different constraints on how they need to spend their money, you know, they got to, you know, you're, you know, you know, what's the saying? What percentage of the population lives paycheck to paycheck, you know, month to month? I forget what percentage of the population it is. And so to encourage them to want to use this, what, what is the value proposition that needs to be communicated more clearly? But I think if that, that boundary gets crossed, uh, I think we definitely could see more adoption, especially if the cost goes down and the value goes up. I'm especially thinking the wearables, the one that, that's like a, a postage stamp, you just stick on. I mean, after it's been there for three days, you'll probably forget it's in place. Uh, but maybe as a consequence of it's monitoring the person's heart or his GI, somebody looking at the data will see a spike and say, oh, that guy just smoked a cigarette. Or, oh, he just took a shot of hard liquor. Or, oh, he just shot heroin. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't designed to do that, but you can imagine, you know, giving all these signals, it, there might be strong correlations with some of those things I mentioned and maybe others. Uh, absolutely, and I, I, that promise is always there. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we did with our 24-hour recordings, you know, I sometimes call this a fishing expedition. So, that, so sometimes you know exactly what target you want to hit and you design for it. In other situations, you just build and you watch what happens. And so we, with our 24-hour ambulatory recording, we went on a fishing expedition and we got good data that we could label. So we built a very simple uh, just app on your phone via Google Documents so you could indicate when you went to sleep, when you woke up, when you had a bowel movement, when you ate a snack or a real meal. And we, started, we wanted to ask high level questions about can we see these different changes and what occurs. And we have some preliminary data that's very, very promising. We think there's a circadian rhythm and see all this interesting stuff that happens in sleep, sleep disorders. So it's, um, that, that opportunity is there. Uh, and I think for researchers, that's fine. I just think that from the perspective of uh, how we think in general about engineering design, I think there needs to be a balance. I, I, I have found that I've had more success when I start off knowing you know, a high level target I want to hit. And I try to nail that target, and then with the technology I develop, perhaps it has other applications. But that's just kind of my personal style and how I've went about things. It's worked well for me. But you're spot on. Once you design it for A, it very well could also have applications for B and C. And researchers are actually using that for A. I mean, they're using these technologies to help people who want to quit smoking and they can tell when their pulse rate is accelerating because of the wearable in real time. They can also tell from the GPS if they're by a place where they typically buy cigarettes. And then they can communicate to them and say, hey, is that what you really want to do? So, but back over, <laughs> back yeah. over here, <laughs> that is. So when, when you think about these, um, the sensors that you're building, what can you do in terms of monitoring of neurological functioning? And, and what if, I think you're also doing not only cognitive functioning, but also some work in the sleep area? Uh, yes, so I, you know, I, I did my postdoctoral study with that gentleman that I showed you, the anesthesiologist and neuroscientist. 
So I very, my original interest for developing this technology was very much neuro related. And so I've been, we've been doing neuro stuff ever since we first developed it. So we, we have a number of EEG studies that we've done where we've been probing cognitive uh, function. And so we can do a variety of things like play a sequence of sounds to you. And if someone were to put a full shower cap of EEG over you, it's been well established with decades of research that um, if you take a look at someone who has Alzheimer's disease, someone who has schizophrenia, bipolar disease, depression, what you find is that their ability to do cognitive updating is somewhat diminished. And you can, you can look at that in an objective manner by playing a sequence of sounds and then having an, an abrupt change in attentional orientation due to a change in tone or a change in volume. And you can watch how the brain waves change. This is typically done with a full shower cap. And we have data showing that if we just put this patch over the forehead, we can still capture that. And specifically, we have data in schizophrenia patients and age match controls showing that we can separate this out uh, between schizophrenia and normals. So, uh, and if you take a look at the underlying etiology for this, this is very similar to what occurs uh, in Alzheimer's disease and bipolar, which is suggestive, it could be applied there. So we have some preliminary data there, that's in the aspects of cognitive updating. Um, in addition, I got very interested in sleep. You know, as, as you guys know, we like to, we have to conquer big problems. And so it turns out that the, uh, uh, as you guys may be aware, that one in five people in America has uh, obstructive sleep apnea, right? And 90% of those people don't know they have it. And part of the reason is because in order for them to determine clinically that you have sleep apnea, they have to send you in this sleep lab where they instrument you with all of these different things over you. And most people don't want to go through that process. And so we've been collaborating with some physicians where we uh, basically just have the patch on the forehead. And by doing some of our sophisticated data science algorithms, showing that we can actually do sleep staging every 30 seconds, seeing what stage of sleep you're in, just with the patch on the forehead and these algorithms. So that's another application you know, that affects one in five people. 90% of them are undiagnosed. And so we, um, that's another application of neurology tailored to sleep. So those are two high level areas, cognitive updating and sleep, that we're spending a lot of time on. And if anyone has more questions or wants to be involved in a, a research study, we have an ongoing sleep study, uh, you're more than welcome. And uh, one thing that's very cool about San Diego, as you guys may be aware of, is that if you do have obstructive sleep apnea, um, ResMed, the company, they have the devices for CPAP. So this, you know, the founder of ResMed is Peter Farrell, who's right here in San Diego. And so he has a strong relationship with our collaborators at UC San Diego. He actually recruited them from Harvard to run the sleep lab we have here. And those are the people we work with. So what, what I like about that is that we can, if we can help identify who has the problem, you know, ResMed is a company who can help foster a solution. So you're really going full circle. Just, you know, one cool thing about San Diego. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and this is a great question. It seems great to have non-invasive continuous measuring of physiological signals, but validating the meaning of the new kind of information requires validation mm -hmm. against existing invasive sensing and or symptoms. How difficult will that be? Uh, excellent question. And uh, you know, I, th I think part of what was said was 24-hour continuous monitoring. I. Um, I would even challenge that. I think everyone has the vision that, oh, you slap this patch on and we wear it forever. But I think for starters would be, uh, oh, we think you might have a sleep problem, we'll send this to you and you wear it overnight for a couple of nights when you sleep and then we'll analyze it. Oh, you're complaining you have a GI problem, we'll send this to you and we'll record it for a couple of days and we send it back. So I, uh, I believe in very sort of targeted approaches for starters. I think over time, as this really picks up, perhaps there's a potential for just continuous monitoring, but I think for starters, a focused approach. That would be my first point. Uh, my second point is uh, the issue of validation. We think that's crucially important to get the buy-in of the physicians because everyone can run around and say, oh, I have this new wearable device and oh, it can measure all of these things. But if you need to take a look at how are clinical decisions made now, what tools do they use now, validate against those tools to, to get the buy-in of the clinical community. And then and only then could you see this really being adopted. So if you notice in the pregnancy study, we had simultaneous monitoring with those conventional belts. And in GI, we have you know, the MRI, the gastric emptying, all these things that are typically done, that's what we're validating against. 
And uh, I think you guys were saying that it might be that we're generating new data that they're not used to seeing. I think that's an excellent point. And the first thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to generate the exact same data that they're used to seeing just in an unobtrusive format. I think that's where you meet the clinical community for starters. If you do that, you can consistently generate the same quality of data in the same format that they're used to seeing it. That's the first uh, approach to adoption. And then by the way, after you're working well with them, you say, and guess what? We have this new data you haven't seen before, but it seems to correlate with all these other things. I think they'll be more, much more interesting to work with you, but we're not starting there. So all of our studies are basically generating the same type of information, uh, but just uh, in these non-invasive ways. Thank you. I mean, that was a question I had about how is digital medicine accepted by the medical community? And is it, it just seems like you're so at the front end of this that those relationships are critical. Absolutely, in my opinion, yeah. But it's, what's the I volume think, of people like you? I think like trying you? to be Uber in this situation <laughs> might not work. If you guys remember Uber, they just, to hell with the establishment, to hell with the regulators. We're just gonna go in these cities and we don't care about the taxi guys. I mean, I think some people are trying to do that with medicine. It's, it's gonna be harder, right? It's gonna be much harder. So I think you wanna work with the establishment and, and to bring it in carefully and in a measured way. And that's, that's exactly the, uh, uh, the path that we're taking. And you know, I mean, so for example, I talked to some of my buddies that are MDs and they'll be frank with you. They say, I don't give a damn about someone's Fitbit because first of all, I don't get reimbursed for that. Secondly, I haven't been trained on how to interpret a Fitbit to make clinical decisions. And so there's, there's multiple at that, those aspects. And so there's always this issue of, of reimbursement and doctors are being squeezed more and more. They, um, it's harder and harder for them to stay in the black and asking them to do more and more without a reimbursement will be increasingly challenging. And moreover, if this data hasn't been validated and they, they're not trained in how to look at it, that's gonna be increasingly challenging. Now, I do think that some of those problems will change with the capitation that I alluded to. Now that the insurance companies are changing how they pay for care, it's not only bill for a procedure, it's also now we're just gonna give you a flat amount of money and all these people that have diabetic gastroparesis, we're gonna lump them together and you have to deal with it. I think the physician community will get more creative there, but that we're in such, that we're at just the forefront, no one really knows how that's gonna take place, yeah. And FDA is not really quite sure what their role is in, in much of this at this point in time. I mean, that's, a, that's evolving as we go. Um, yes, and I had a chance to you know, give a talk at the FDA in September uh, last year. And uh, one thing that is for sure, though, is that they are increasingly interested in new technologies that measure existing stuff that's been, that, that clini clinicians know how to make decisions with. And if you meet them there, they'll be very interested in trying to fast track your, your, your technologies. And so they're, they're bullish. You know, one thing else that's very interesting about the FDA, uh, it used to be that you just built a device. I built an EEG monitoring system. And if I can show that my EEG monitoring system has the same quality of EEG as this other existing system, then they approve the device. Increasingly now, they're not just gonna approve the device, they're gonna ask how is this going to be used. So, uh, they, they, so, so you need to have approval for your technology, but also how it's going to be used in what clinical context. And those need to be matched up together, which is, you know, an int you know it makes sense and it's, uh, uh, a, very, a very interesting thing that people need to be aware of. And you bring up something that is maybe not high on the awareness of the public, and that is FDA controls medically and clinically relevant devices and drugs. And you think about all of the apps that are available, millions of apps that have marketed themselves as fitness, or, or life management, right. but they don't market themselves as health products or clinical care, so the FDA does not have anything to do with them. And I've had an interesting conversation with, with a psychiatrist who wants to prescribe an app that is available and thinks it might help a patient, and there is no regulatory oversight there. And so he's coming up with some decision-making tools to help psychiatrists think about what is the safety, what are the privacy issues, what are, 
Is it is it effective? Is the data sharing right. possible? So I mean, this is kind of like this new frontier when you get outside of the clinical care. Well, I'll give you a good example. So it turns out there is a change that's taking place, which is fascinating. So you guys can look this up. There's this uh, company uh, called WellDoc. Yeah. Uh, have you have you heard of them? Uh, so. What they did is they really changed the status quo. So typically when you think about a pharmaceutical, they have a drug, they have a compound that goes in your body and it treats some condition. So this company is all about trying to treat uh, type two diabetes. And so they came up with an idea of having an app that just gives you recommendations and reminders what to eat, what not to eat, you know, along the lines of what she's talking about. But what they did, which I thought was brilliant, is they said, we're not just gonna be an app, we deliberately want to be regulated. We wanna be regulated by the FDA, and we want to look at ourselves as basically as a pharma. So they, so they took a look at what is the pathway that pharma takes towards success. The first thing you do is you show that your drug is safe. So they say we have a drug, which is an app, clearly it's safe. Uh, the next step they said is does it have a therapeutic effect? So there are existing drugs on the market for type two diabetes that reduce your A1C. They did a, a careful clinical trial, just like a pharma company would, where they uh, showed that by using this app, you know, age match controls, et cetera, you see a reduction in A1C, and the reduction in A1C was about the same as the existing drugs. And then they turned around and they marketed it to get uh, regulatory approval from the FDA. They got the regulatory approval, and now they've actually, the last step always is to get insurance reimbursement. And now some many insurance companies reimburse them as a therapeutic entity, almost as a pharma company, yet it's an app, which is a in very interesting business model. You know the first one who does it always you know, takes it to the top. So many other people are trying to be copycats with this, but it's a, an interesting story and in innovation, how we're re re rethinking what pharma means. Uh, but what I think is interesting is um, it has this therapeutic effect, but it's collecting all this data about you and one thing about a drug is that if I'm just taking a drug, data is not being collected about me. So what are the unintended consequences of using this app? And could this be used against me? It's, it's a very, very interesting space. It's just very interesting, thought-provoking stuff. And it's not covered by HIPAA. So those of you that know that your medical record has some kind of you know, regulatory privacy protections, these companies that are collecting your data that is health has health its health data, but but it's not covered by any of these protections. And the Federal Trade Commission is actually responsible for starting to develop these, and they're working on it. But just food for thought, it's not protected. I agree. I'm looking forward to seeing a Supreme Court case about something like this one day, about someone's data and it being used for a variety of different purposes. You know, it reminds me of. Uh, Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks, is anyone familiar with her? Or, you know, it's sort of Henrietta Lacks in the, in the 21st century. What will the implications of that be? Uh, we don't know, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanna stop there and thank Dr. Todd Coleman for an amazing presentation. Mm -hmm.